Right, now we're on to the third week now, and this week we're going to learn how to identify and how to analyse arguments, and how to set them out logic book style. And the point of doing this is it enables you to get rid of all sorts of things that are irrelevant to the argument, and you set out the argument so the structure of the argument is very clear. That way it's much easier to evaluate. Okay, uh, let's get started. Okay, um, just a brief recap as usual on last week. If you remember, we looked at um, the fact that there are two basic types of argument, uh, deductive and inductive. And um, we saw that deductive arguments are such that, come on, tell me, don't look at your handouts, tell me what a deductive argument is. How do you recognise it? Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, yeah. Aren't you good? Haven't you done well? You're absolutely right. That's right. Um, the truth of the premise makes the, the truth of the conclusion certain. Or those of you who use the word guarantee, the truth of the premise guarantees the truth of the conclusion. Well done. That's absolutely right. OK, then inductive arguments are such that... Good, OK, I, I can hear that you've got it as well. OK, I've put it slightly differently this week, because if you remember last week, we got into trouble with the way I phrased it as more or less, um, because we don't want promises making less probable the conclusion, do we? So I've said, the truth of the premise makes the truth of the conclusion more likely. And, of course, as you know, it's either much more likely, as in the case of... Um, the sun has risen in the, uh, every day in the whole history of the universe, therefore it's likely it'll rise tomorrow. And it's really pretty likely, isn't it? It's almost certain. Um, or slightly more likely. So the fact that every time you've seen me I've been wearing earrings makes it slightly more likely that the next time you see me I'll be wearing earrings. So um, the, the, whereas deduction is an either-or thing, uh, induction is a matter of degree. An argument is more or less strong. Good. We then looked at some examples of arguments that are deductively valid in virtue of their form. And do you remember I was using the P's and Q's and so on to talk about things like modus ponens and modus tollens and so on. So we got if P then Q, P therefore Q. That's valid in virtue of its form because it doesn't matter what you're talking about, it doesn't matter what sentences you put in for P or Q, um, if, the, if the structure of the argument is, if P then Q, P therefore Q, it will be valid. Okay. So then we looked at some arguments that are deductively valid in virtue of their content. Can you remember any of those? This is a bit harder because they were only examples that we gave. Good? Uh, not quite. <laughs> Lying is wrong, therefore we sh shouldn't lie. Exactly. Do you remember, see how that is... Um, if that's a deductively valid argument, it's in virtue of the meaning of the word wrong, isn't it? Lying is wrong, therefore we shouldn't lie. So the thought is that... If you understand the word wrong properly, you'll see that if lying is wrong, if you believe lying is wrong, then you'll also believe that you shouldn't lie. doesn't mean you won't lie, but it does mean that if you do, you'll feel guilty um, or whatever. But that's in virtue of the meaning of the word wrong. Can you remember any other arguments that were valid in virtue of the content, the meaning of particular words? Um, right, I can't remember the particular example I used there. Um, I don't think that would have been one, actually. Uh, I might be wrong about that, but I have a feeling that was an example that I used of one of the ones that's valid in virtue of form. Okay. Uh, no, that came later. Temporal, yes, okay, that was one. Can you remember how that went? Okay. That's right, it's raining today, therefore tomorrow it will have rained today. Okay, so and that, that's um, because of the word tomorrow and 
um, our understanding of before and after and yesterday and today and so on. OK, good. Then we moved on to inductive arguments, and we looked at several different examples of an inductive argument. Uh, can you remember any of those? You, you mentioned one a minute ago. I think it was... Yes, what was it about Einstein? It was an argument from authority. Good. OK, so this man's an authority uh, on this. Therefore, he said this. Therefore, he's an authority on this. That's a bad way of looking at it, but, but you can see it, that assumes the principle of what? What's behind every inductive argument? Logic. Uh, logic, <laughs> yes. Um, continuity, yes. Can anyone put it in the way I put it last week? There's a principle that Hume is most famous for, David Hume. He said the principle of the... Uniformity. Uniformity of... N of nature, that's right. So what's happened in the past will happen in the future. If it was like that in the past, it's going to be like that in the future, and so on. That's the principle of the uniformity of nature, which underlies every inductive argument and which can't itself be argued for, because arguing for it takes us in a circle. Why is the future like the past? Because it always has been. Well, again, we're relying on induction, aren't we? OK, so we looked at some examples. This week, uh, we're going to be learning how to identify and analyse arguments and how to set them out logic book style. So if you've got some arguments from this week that you had trouble um, analysing or you had trouble recognising, you'll be able to use the arguments that you found this week to um, practise what we're going to learn today. OK, so let's start by seeing an argument set out logic book style. You're getting sick of this argument, aren't you? I'm getting sick of this argument. But here it is again, set out logic book style. OK, you don't have to write out premise one in full. You can just put P1, or you don't even have to put that. You can just assume that the premises come first and then the conclusion. But that's an argument set out logic book style. And you might ask, well, what's the point of setting out arguments logic book style? Has anyone got any idea? Why, why do we bother setting out arguments logic book style? It would clarify it for us. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yep. It makes it much stronger uh, than if you're trying to argue your point. It should make it stronger because what you're doing in setting out an argu argument logic book style is just identifying the argument. You, therefore, you shouldn't... You, shouldn't be able to make it either stronger or weaker. All you're doing is identifying what the argument is. So we're not evaluating it at the moment. We're just s analysing it, just setting it out logic book style. A, no a non-logic book style might um, include assumptions. Good. Whereas a logic book style would have to include Absolutely, that's, that's right. What we do in setting out an argument logic book style is we actually identify all the premises. So if there's a, su a suppressed premise or an assumption, as Paul says, um, we, we try and make it explicit if we can. Do you do it um, in a set format so you don't have to rearrange the sentences to, put the, to, get, to work out what the premise is and what the conclusions are? Absolutely. It's a set format. So, so uh, if you remember what was on there, you've got premise, premise, conclusion. So we know exactly what is being argued for, because that's what the conclusion is, isn't it? And we know exactly what's being put forward as reasons for believing that thing, which are the premises. Any other ideas on this? One, one two, and then we'll move on. That's right, because if you remember, I was asking you to identify the premises and the conclusion. Of course, you have to be able to do that to set out an argument logic book style. But once you've done it, once you've set it out logic book style, then it's obvious. Yep, um, one, two. The gentleman behind you was first. Yep. Um, well, just building on that point, it enables you to identify what form of argument is being used. Um, it can do, yes, yes. Yes, that might also come later. Again, we'll have a look at that later on. One more. It's easier to spot a mistake in the argument. Um, oh, up to a point, as we'll see, Lord Copper. <laughs> OK, um, I've put down... There, there's the one we mentioned. It enables us to add suppressed premises. 
It enables us to eliminate cross-references, irrelevancies, and inconsistent terms. Okay, and, and that makes it much easier to identify the argument. We'll go through all this, so if you don't quite understand what I mean here, don't worry about it, we'll, we'll cover it in a minute. Um, and it makes it much, much easier to evaluate the argument, as I hope you'll see today. Okay, um, right, on the surface of it, it's easy to set out arguments logic book style. Let's try this one. You've, you're familiar with this. You've seen this argument before. First of all, tell me what's the conclusion of this argument. Tell me what the which is the conclusion. Good. Edinburgh is north of Oxford. So, and um, premise one. Good. And I'm glad you left out the word since because that's a logical word, isn't it? That doesn't. Act, that's not actually part of the sentence that is the premise. So you were absolutely right to leave that out. OK, premise one then. So you're writing down premise one. Manchester is north of Oxford. Premise two? Edinburgh is north of Manchester. Good. And the conclusion, Edinburgh is north of Oxford. And you left out since and and. Well done. Those two are the logical words. They're the words on which the validity of the argument hangs, uh, as we'll see later. But we, we leave them out of the identification of the premise and the conclusion. OK, um, let's try this one. What's the conclusion? Which is float, yeah. OK, the conclusion is which is float. Premise one. Which is made of wood. Wood floats, good. Um, again, you left out the logical words, and that's right. Can I just give you a warning of this? And is a logical word. But and here is connecting which two parts of language? I mean, two of the same parts of language. What's it connecting here? Two... Premises. Uh, two premises, OK. But what are premises? They're sentences. sentences. So and here is a sentence connector. OK, and we can connect any sentences we want. Here, here it is used again, connecting these two sentences. But what about this one? Um, Oedipus is a black and white cat. OK, is and working as a sentence connective there? Oedipus is a black and white cat. What's it connecting there? Two adjectives or two predicates, as we would say in logic. So you've got to be a bit careful um, when you see and in a sentence. Sometimes and will be part of the content uh, if it's not combining two sentences but two predicates. Are you with me? So um, just watch out for that. Keep, keep an eye open for that. Right, good. Well, we've set those two out, logic book stars. OK, now try this one. The. <laughs> OK, now I'm not serious about your trying that one right at the minute, but we are going to do that one before the end of today. OK, but this is another reason we set it out logic book style, because you can look straight at those arguments and you can pretty well see what the form is, can't you? you can, the other ones, you can see whether they're good arguments, you can tell straight off. But this is... Uh, now, uh, those of you who found arguments from ma magazines or newspapers of this week, were your arguments more like that one? Yeah. Or more, yes, OK. And this is why they're so difficult, because actually, when we're in the pub arguing with each other about whether euthanasia is acceptable or not, or whether we should go for assisted suicide or not, we, we add all sorts of things to our arguments. We say things like, um, well, if that's true, I'm a Dutchman. What does that mean? If that's true, I'm a Dutchman, what does that mean in English? Not it's not true. So when I say, if that's true, I'm a Dutchman, all I'm actually saying is, that's not true. OK, um, let's see if I can think of another one. Uh, no, I can't, because I'm doing it off the top of my head. But in, in English, when we're talking, we use all sorts of colloquialisms, we add all sorts of things, we, we have all sorts of ums and ahs and ers, and, um, and it makes it very difficult to... Um, identify the argument itself and that's what you're doing when you set out an argument logic book style is you're getting rid of all the irrelevancies okay here's a set of steps for analyzing arguments I'm not using this microphone by the way can people at the back hear me yes. yeah okay um, here's a set of steps for, for analyzing arguments we're going to follow these steps um, today, and I, I meant to actually write them out on the board, and I forgot. Um, so you'll have to keep referring back as I ask you, what do we do next? You'll have to keep referring back to slide 11. 
Okay. Firstly, let's look at identifying premises and conclusions. We've, we've already done quite a lot of this, so this is fairly easy. Um, we look for the argument indicators, and I've given quite a few here, um, and then we identify... Well, OK, in identifying the conclusion, what are we looking for? What, tell me again what a conclusion is. Another bit of revision. <coughs> Now, careful, what is the conclusion? It's not the reason for the truth of the other premises. The other premises is what you said, actually, isn't it? What? Yeah. That's right. It's, it's what it is you're arguing for, isn't it? It's, it's the final... You, you were just getting mixed up there, and it's very easy to get mixed up. And when you get mixed up, of course, you invert it, which gets everything wrong. But um, that's easy to do. But the, the conclusion, you can only tell which is the conclusion by looking at the function of that sentence in the argument. And what a conclusion is, is the thing you are arguing for. It's, in effect, the statement you're making. And then the premises are... the supporting evidence or, or the supporting reasons. You've got to be a bit careful with evidence because um, they're not always... They're arguments rather than evidence. They don't know they're true necessarily. Yeah, exactly so. Yeah. OK, good. Uh, let's, here's an easy one. Um, identify the argument indicators in these arguments. What about the first one? Which is the argument indicator in this one? There are two, actually. Since, good. Is there another one? Four. Four. Well done. You're getting good at this. OK. What about this one? Put up your hands this time. I'm going to... Uh, OK. What's the argument indicator in this one? Stick your hand up if you're... When, once you've found it. Because some people, and I, I have to admit I'm one of them, think quite slowly. And if people yell out, it's, they don't get a chance to think. OK, now you can all yell out together. Because. because, that's right, yep, good, OK. What about this one? Put your hand up again. Quite easy, this one, isn't it? OK, again? Yes. Yep, there we are. And there it is. You've got them all right. Oh, actually, the red isn't very good, is it? Can you see that I've marked them all in red? If you can't see, you'll see it on your handout. That's a shame. I didn't realise that the red doesn't show. <laughs> OK. Now, we're going to practice looking at conclusions. We've, uh, we, again, we've done this before, so um, this isn't difficult at all. What's the conclusion here? <coughs> what is it? Have another... Shh. Don't yell out. OK, have another look at the argument. Remind yourself what a con conclusion is and tell me. Socrates is, Socrates is mortal. Yes, why did you get that confused? I mean, there's a very good reason for getting it confused. What is it? What, what, what? It's at the end. It's not at the end. You are, you're, you've been expecting to see the conclusion at the end, haven't you? Um, but, but as you see from this one, it doesn't need to be at the end. In this one, it's in the middle, isn't it? So um, it's, it, remember what I say, that the you can only tell which is the conclusion by looking at the function of, of played by a particular sentence. The conclusion is the sentence you are arguing for. OK, so here's the... Um, and it's this in red, just as you said... Socrates is mortal, is the conclusion. OK, find the conclusion of this argument. Now put up your hand again, rather than yelling out. <coughs> and don't worry if it takes you a bit of time. Some people just do think more slowly, and that's fine. OK, what is it? Socialism was doomed to ah, you're brilliant. There you are. Exactly right. Socialism was doomed to failure. OK, as picked out in red. And what about this one? Mm. 
hands up. Okay, would you like to have a go? Um, yes, okay, they will continue to need help from industrial nations. Now, here's a little hint for something that's coming. Do you remember I said that setting something out logic book style enables you to remove cross-references, irrelevancies, and whatever the other one was? Okay, looking at this one, can you have an idea of what I meant there? Because this... Put up your hand if you, can, if you think you see what I can mean. Okay? Yeah, the sense is misleading because it's not with the conclusion. Um, no, that's, that's actually not what I mean there. I was thinking, um, I think you thought I meant in the whole argument, but actually I just meant in they will continue to need help from industrial nations. Just look at the conclusion there. Can you see what I might have meant by saying we need to remove cross-references and inconsistent terms and so on? You, the, the actual conclusion is newly emerging nations. Well done. They will continue to need Because this they is an anaphoric reference, isn't it? It takes us back to something that's already been said, and we need to identify that, because when we separate it out as the conclusion, we're left with a statement that actually has no meaning, does it, in the... They will continue to need to... Well, who's they? Um, so we need to remove that cross-reference, and we'll be seeing how to do that later. There's also a suppressed premise in there. Uh, indeed, there is, and we'll be looking at that later, I think. Good, well done. OK, there's the um, conclusion, though, picked out in red. I'll pick it out in green next week. Perhaps you could put it in italics, because it would show up on the post Yes, OK, that's a good idea. I'll do that. Um, Yes, because it's already in bold, but I could easily do it in... Or I could do it in capital letters, couldn't I? OK, um, identify all the premises of this argument, um, and don't forget that there might be a suppressed premise. Now, this is going to take you a little longer. Don't call out. You might have to write it down. Um, put up your hand when you've identified the premises of that argument. And a hint, there are two of them. Put up your hand when you've finished. You'll have to paraphrase a little bit, and if you're finding that, don't, don't worry about it. If, if you're thinking, I can't be right because I'm not using exactly the same words, don't worry about that. Paraphrase is fine. What, what you mustn't do is change the meaning of anything, but paraphrasing it to get the grammar right or whatever is fine. Okay, right. Would you like to tell us, sir? Yep. Okay, that's premise one. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> yes, that, that would do. Okay, any variation on those themes? So here it is. Premise one, incentives are needed for a prosperous economy. Premise two, socialism did not provide incentives Conclusion, socialism was doomed to failure. Okay, do you see where both those premises come from? Okay, they're needed. Which one is the suppressed premise? Uh, yes, that's right. The first one was suppressed in the original argument, but, but it's made explicit as we set out the argument logic book style. And if you had any variation on this theme, that's fine, so long as it has the same meaning. Does anyone want to check some? Isn't there another suppressed premise in there that um, a, prosperous e a prosperous economy um, is, is needed for socialism? Um, well, 
I think what you're thinking of, well, is this what you're thinking of? Doomed to failure. I mean, you want something like you will only succeed if you have a prosperous economy, don't you? Okay. Um, that's really in, you've got that in premise one, haven't you? Or you could have something like uh, you have succeeded only if you if you have a prosperous economy. You could add that. Okay, um, you don't need to make. I, I mean, quite honestly, if you make explicit everything, you might find yourself. Um, is that my mobile? No, it's yours. Good. Well, bad. <laughs> um, but better than it's being mine. <laughs> I, I completely accept your point. I, I think you could easily add another premise in there and you could say um, prosperous economies are needed for success, incentives are needed for prosperous economies, socialism did not provide incentives, therefore socialism was not a success or something. Do you see? I, uh, we could easily have added that one in as well and, and made explicit two suppressed premises. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, anyone else have anything? Not quite this. No? Okay, good. Let's do it again with this one. So, since many newly emerging nations do not have the capital resources needed for necessary for sustained growth, they will continue to need help from industrial nations. You'll find, actually, as you practice at this, it gets much, much easier. Um, and another trick is, if you have not quite seen it, is to ident identify the sentences that make up the premise, if, if you can. I mean, here you've only got one sentence. And then see what else you need to make, make an argument. OK, let's, let's try some. Uh, many new emerging nations do not have capital resources. Let me try one. Capital resources are necessary for sustained growth. Mm -hmm. OK, so many newly emerging nations will continue to need help. Yeah. Anyone have anything different? But is it also not suppressed that industrial nations do have capital resources? No. Um, <coughs> yes, that's certainly implicit in that argument, so you can make it in explicit if you like. Yep. Yeah. OK. Uh, a cap um, industrial nations need um, emerging na nations to um, have sustained growth. Well, because that, that would be one of the main reasons for having well, no, now, now, now you've got to be careful because when you're identifying the premise, don't put in anything that you happen to believe. What you're doing is you're identifying the argument that whoever it is that wrote this is making. Now, we haven't, we're not yet evaluating the argument. We may decide that, that they're wrong uh, in all sorts of ways, but what we don't do is add things on. All we're doing here is, is sticking to the meaning of the original. We can paraphrase, but we mustn't change the meaning. To change the meaning is, is really bad. Really, really bad. <laughs> OK, is there anything else that anyone wants to try? This is, oh, yes, one more. Yep, OK. Um, when, when you're adding suppressed premises, try and be careful not to add more than you need for the argument. Um, that, I mean, let's have a look. Let's see what I put down, and then let's see whether we still need that. So I've put down, many newly emerging nations do not have capital resources. Capital resources are necessary for sustained growth. If a newly emerging nation is to sustain its growth and it does not have capital resources, it will need help from industrial nations. Conclusion, many newly emerging nations will need help from industrial nations. Uh, well, is it? Now, remember in the very first week we looked at the difference between implication and entailment. Does anyone remember what the difference between implication and entailment is? And don't worry if you don't, because it's, it's a very sophisticated distinction, but it's important to realise. If we've got an if-then statement, are we asserting either the antecedent, the if clause, or the consequent, the then clause, 
Or are we just saying if P then Q? We're not actually claiming that P or Q, are we? If we say if P then Q. Are you with me? So, so is there a conclusion in if P then Q? Is, is, does a something of that structure have the premise and conclusion structure that would make it an argument? No, it doesn't, does it? What it has is two sentences combined with the logical phrase, if, then. But actually, you're, you're not claiming anything, and you're not backing up anything by offering reasons. So it's not an argument, it's an implication. Do you understand that? Um, that would be a case of putting in a suppressed premise too far from uh, my perspective. And I think that's because we, d we haven't specified what help they need here. We're, we're just saying, um, OK, you've got... Uh, if that, then that. And that's saying the if is um, true if you like, so then that. We don't actually need to spell out what the that is. I, I can see why you want that, yeah, but I would say it's not necessary for the argument. You could just say the World Bank. Yeah. You could just say what? The World Bank. You know, would need help from the World Bank. No, I would just say you could destroy the argument by saying World Bank. The World Bank is not an industrial nation, but people get capital resources from the World Bank. Well, an issue with the content rather than the structure of the yes, and I think you just need to let the content go. I don't agree with it either. But the the, it the fact is, what we're doing is we're identifying okay. the argument. We're not evaluating it yet. Do you see? Do you see the difference? We're just identifying it. Then we evaluate it. So we do have to let the content go. But he is quite right that if there is another suppressed premise there that's needed for the argument, we need to bring it out. Um, but I don't think that was one of them. Well, is this argument saying what sort of help they need from... I mean, I agree it's an implication there, but I don't think it's... Um, you said need help for the industrial nations, and the only way that they can receive help is if the other ones are provided. And we're saying that the premise is that capital resources are necessary for sustained growth, so that would be the only type of help that they, we would be talking about. Okay, um... So it could be that instead of it will need help, we should change that help to capital resources. Do you see what I mean? So, so it would then read, many new emerging nations do not have capital resources. Capital resources are necessary for sustained growth. If a newly emerging nation is to sustain its growth and it does not have capital resources, it will need capital resources from industrial nations. Do you see what I mean? And then, the, in the same way, we'd say many newly emerging nations will need capital resources from sustain. So that we would be getting the premise that you want in by removing inconsistent terms rather than by adding another premise. Well, the point is that we're talking about the two premises of about capital resources, and therefore the conclusion should be related to capital resources. But, but I'm saying it is... Well, I'll tell you what, let's come back to this when we've looked at inconsistent terms, because I hope then I'll be able to convince you that it is actually in there, it's just in there in an inconsistent way. OK, but, but do remind me to come back. Is there not a suppressed premise that the only source of help or, or resources is from industrial nations? Otherwise, the conclusion doesn't follow. Um, well, no, because the conclusion is that they will need help. Um, uh, I mean, don't forget the premises may be false. I mean, nobody's saying that the premises are true at the moment. We're just wanting to identify the premise. No, so the the well, that we worry about later. We're, we're not evaluating the argument at the moment. We're, we're just 
analysing it. We're, we're putting down exactly what was said in the argument, or what was said and what was implied in the argument. Well, I think if we change that to capital resources, it does say that. I mean, aren't we implying in this argument that the help that the industrialised nations are giving to the newly emerging nations is capital resources? But you, it, it is given that you understand that. Yes, absolutely, yeah. But that's why when, when we get round to removing inconsistent terms, which we haven't got round to yet, that's one of the things we would want to make explicit. So there are different ways of making things explicit. One is by adding suppressed premises, and another is by, by removing inconsistent terms. And, and we'll, uh, I've already promised we'll come back to this argument when we've done that and make sure that we're clear on that. Uh, I wouldn't. <laughs> Not at the moment, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, OK, now, you've done so well, we're going to try the really complicated argument. OK, we'll do that for the rest of this session. Here's the argument. OK, this is the one. By the end of this session, you will have analysed this argument and seen how it works. OK, um, firstly, identify the conclusion of this argument. OK, right. Who wants to... Who hasn't had a go? Would you like to have a go? What's the... Uh, oh, sorry, I was asking that lady there. You deserve to get scratched. Uh, there's a bit more to it than that. The, that is part of the conclusion. Um... Well, it's not if you tickle her tummy, is it? It's if you... If... <laughs> okay, somebody, somebody else. Um... Well, I thought it was going to be she didn't want you to tickle her tummy. Uh, just she didn't want you to tickle her tummy. Okay, no, wrong. <laughs> That's just the whole sentence. So if the poor thing did want you to tickle her tummy, then you Absolutely, it's the whole sentence. It's actually a conditional conclusion. If the poor thing did want you to tickle her tummy, you deserve to get scratched. <coughs> so it's not that you deserve to get scratched on its own, because it's, you only deserve to get scratched if she did want you to tickle her tummy. Do you see what I mean? That, that's, the whole thing is a conditional conclusion. Uh, and you said something like, uh, if you tickled her tummy... Um, and I wasn't sure whether you were leaving out that if she wanted you to tickle her tummy, because actually that's, that's very important, because there's a big difference between you tickled her tummy and she wanted you to tickle her tummy, isn't there? Um, and, and for the so purposes of this argument, that's actually quite an important difference. So the, the conclusion, and, and I said there was a nice large argument indicator right in front of it, and here it is. So if the poor thing did want you to tickle her tummy, you deserve to get scratched. That's the conclusion. OK, everyone happy with that? Can you see that um, the fact that it's a conditional sentence, a complex sentence, doesn't stop it from being a conclusion? Because a conclusion is what? Again? It's, it's the, the claim for which you're arguing, that's right. It's the statement that you're making and that you're backing up with reasons. OK, what's the next thing we do, having identified the conclusion? We identify the premises. OK, identify the premises of that argument. Um, yes, yeah. Sometimes within an argument, you, you get sort of sub-arguments. Um, but don't worry about that. Treat it as a premise, not a conclusion. OK, I think we're getting there. I'm going to reveal what I've got, and then you can tell me if you've got something else. OK, this is premise one. Well, perhaps she didn't want you to tickle her tummy, or she didn't realise that's what you were going to do. Now, I've just realised that I've, I've misled you in something, because I, I 
I praised you for leaving out the argument indicators, whereas actually the only argument indicators I want you to leave out are the synths and the fours and so on. Um, this or here uh, is making this, these two sentences into a complex sentence. So it's, you should leave that in. Okay, so the premise there, you can see the structure of that, can't you? P or Q. Um, so the or is part of it. Yeah. Um, no, you mustn't. Uh, the only one you can actually separate like that is and. Because if you have P and Q, then just two separate premises will do. But if you have P or Q, do you see that the, that the or is rather different, isn't it, logically? Um, you can't just have one sentence. If, if I say, look, here's a way of doing it, and we're taking, um, if I've got a pen, yes? Right, we're moving ahead a little bit here in what I'm going to tell you. So if you start getting confused, just stop your ears up. Um, when we eventually get round to evaluating arguments, what we try and do is to set out the conditions under which each premise is true, so we can then set out the conditions under which they're all true together. Okay, don't worry about how we do that at the moment, it's just that's what we try and do. Now, if I look at um, P and Q, I can say, well, this is true, this whole sentence is true, isn't it? If there's one world in which P is true and Q is true, is that right? Do you, do you see intuitively that? So what is it for P and Q to be true? Well, it's for P to be true and Q to be true in the same world or in the same situation, if you prefer. So I can represent it just with one line and putting P and Q on the same line. Whereas if I say P or Q, I can't do that, can I? P or Q is true just in case what? <coughs> yeah, either P is true or Q is true, or sometimes both. Um, so I'd have to draw two lines and put P on one line and Q on the other, wouldn't I? in order to say P or Q. So th they have, they're different words, different logical words. And do you see how if I separate the P and Q in one premise, it doesn't really matter. Whereas if I separate the P or Q, it does matter. Because then I've only got one on each line. Um, so I must keep them together. Um, in fact, what I should do is keep them all together, um, just because at this moment you don't know what the difference between and and or and so on is. So any, any complex sentence, just keep them together. Okay, did anyone have something different from that other than s just separating the two sentences? And, and actually, your separating the two sentences was because I misled you in the beginning, so don't knock yourself for that. Well, what, think about what we're doing here. Do you remember I said we've got to keep the meaning? The meaning has got to be the same, whatever else we do. Now, this sentence is saying either this is true or this is true. Is that right? Okay, so if we separate them, so we've lost the or, um, we've just got this is true and this is true. Do you see? That's they fine because she true. cannot want you to tickle her and it doesn't matter whether she realises what you're doing or not, she still doesn't want you to tickle her. So they still stand independently regardless. They, they're two independent centres, I completely agree. You, you, I mean, it might be true that she did want you, didn't want you to tickle her and it might be true that she didn't realise that you were going to tickle her. But what this sentence says is that either this or this. And that's what we have to... I mean... Okay, so, so the premise of the argument is we start off with either this or this. Do you remember the first, when we were doing the argument? Um, I can understand it. It's either sunny or it's raining. Because you can't have one without... Well, look at P or Q. P 
uh, sorry, not P, therefore Q. OK, do you remember that argument? P or Q, not P, therefore Q. Yeah, that I understand. OK. But that's not the same here. What, OK, why, OK, now I'm not understanding you. Why not? Because there's a statement which is she doesn't want you to tickle her tummy. Now, if that is the case... It doesn't matter whether she realised you wanted to tickle her tummy or not. Her reaction was independent of her knowing what... But why is that a problem? Because remember here, the two sentences are completely independent of each other. We talked about it's, if it's, it's either sunny or rainy. Now, that shouldn't give you the... Because uh, we could say it's either sunny or um, windy. But we haven't said that. If then is completely different from or. If then is a different logical claim. So what was this again then? Sorry, I don't want to right. the time. I no, no. Uh, I'm sure you're things. not the only person who's, <laughs> who's confused by this. Um, all this says here is either this is true yes. or this is true. And what's the next bit of the sentence? And this says this isn't true, therefore this must be. So listen to the logic again. Either this or this. Sorry, I, I'll do it. Either this or that. Yeah. Not this, therefore that. And it doesn't matter what this or that is. Do you see what I mean? So, yeah. so here we say... Either she didn't want you to tickle her, or she didn't realise what you were going to do. She didn't want you to tickle her, therefore... Well, yeah, but yeah, but hang on. This is only, this, but nothing follows from this. This is only one premise. Okay. We've got to get the whole argument before anything follows. And you don't have to be able to do that. Please. No, I, I was just using that to illustrate that the or can stand between two two independent sen sentences. Okay. It doesn't matter what the sentences are; their content is irrelevant. Okay. okay. If you still don't understand that, see me afterwards. It, um, is anyone else still bothered by this? Put your hand up if you want me to go over that again. No, okay. See me afterwards if you're, okay. you still haven't got it. Okay, does anyone have anything else for premise one than this, other than having divided the two up? No? Okay, good. Premise two. If she didn't realise, then you obviously went about it in the wrong way. Does anyone have something different for that? No? No? Premise three, in that case you deserve to get scratched unless you really thought she was such a perceptive cat that she'd understand woof, woof meant roll over. Sorry, say that again. Well, because remember that you're not evaluating the argument at this point. What you're doing is you're trying to capture the meaning of each premise. If you left out in that case, you deserve to get scratched unless... You, so you just have... Um, unless... You just have, unless you really thought she was such a perceptive cat. Well, that's actually, that's actually not even a sentence, is it? In order to be a premise, it has to be a sentence. It might be a complex sentence, but it has to be a sentence. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone have anything different there? No? Good. You're doing very well. Premise four, if you thought that, you're an idiot, but you're not an idiot, you're just twisted. Anyone have anything different for that? If you thought that, you, you sorry, you, what did you have? Uh, okay. Okay. At this point, I, I actually sympathise with your having left that out, um, and you'll see why in a minute. But you shouldn't have left it out at this point because it is actually in there. So, so you should put it in. What were you going to say? Well, I was going to say that I didn't like it to be premised. I considered it because I thought it was an irrelevancy, actually, to the argument. Okay. At the moment, we're not removing irrelevancies. But perhaps when we do, we'll take this out. But at the moment, we'll leave it in. OK. But, but your intuition that it's irrelevant is, is a good one, as you'll see in a minute. 
OK, so there's the argument set out logic book style uh, as it actually stands at the moment. But of course, we haven't finished at the moment because we need to remove all sorts of bits and pieces. So on your list of the steps to set out an arg argument logic book style, what's the third step? We've identified the premises and the conclusions. What do we do next? Sorry? Right. Actually, I'll tell, tell you now, there aren't any suppressed premises, so, so we don't have to worry with that here. What's the next step? Remove irrelevancies. OK, um, let me see how we've done that. OK, what we need to do is take each premise separately. Now, the nice thing about having identified the premises and the conclusions separately is we can treat each one separately now. We don't have to do them all, all at the same time, and that, that helps us. So let's look at premise one, and let's remove the irrelevancies from premise one. Just get rid of any words that are not contributing to what that sentence means, that are just bits of fluff, if you like. Well, yes, that, that can go, can't it? I mean, that, that doesn't do anything. What else? Anything else? Perhaps, I think perhaps can go as well. Yep, OK. There's one more word I'd get rid of, actually. Not or, no. <laughs> tummy. Who said tummy? Yep. You can get rid of tummy, can't you? So what you've got is she didn't want you to tickle her or she didn't realise that was what you were going to do. So here we are. The green. Is that green easier than red? OK. So if we get rid of well, perhaps, and tummy, we've got she didn't want you to tickle her or she didn't realise that's what you were going to do. OK. Let's try premise two. What have you got? Then and obviously. Then and obviously. If she didn't realise, then... No, I'll leave the then in, yeah. But the obviously can go, can't it? The obviously is just a bit of... You know, whether it was obvious or not is completely irrelevant. It might not have been obvious. It wouldn't really matter, would it? OK, so we take out the obviously. Next, premise three. Well, the only word I would take out is really. You'd take out only really, unless you really thought. You can certainly take out really. Yep. Really? So she is? She has? In that case? Uh, not in that case. Why not in that case? Can anyone? Exactly. The, it refers. To, it says, if this, if that is true, then something. So in that case, is really very important. Okay, I'll t show you what I'd take out. I'd take out the lot. Yeah. Uh, in that case, you deserve to get scratched. Because actually, if you look at the fourth premise, which I'd also take out completely. If you thought that you're an idiot, but you're not an idiot, you're just twisted. This is, this is just a little insult that somebody's putting into the argument in order to um, ram it home, isn't it? Oh, come on, you idiot, you can't not believe this, which means what? <laughs> well, it means just this, doesn't it? If I say P and you're an idiot if you don't believe it, what, what am I saying? Just on the whole, well, yes, I'm also saying you're an idiot if I put it that way, don't I? Um, but it, so premises um, four, premise four can go completely, and premise three, to see that, let's go back to the whole argument. OK. And let me read it out to you, because it's sometimes much easier. If you, if you ever find you're having trouble with an argument, try reading it out loud, because that'll the tone you put on it will give you a much better idea of... of where you're going with the logic. So let's read it out. Well, perhaps she didn't want you to tickle her tummy, or she didn't realise that's what you were going to do. If she didn't realise, then you obviously went about it in the wrong way. In that case, you deserve to get scratched. Well, unless you'd really thought she was such a perceptive cat that she'd understand woof, woof meant roll over. But if you thought that, you're an idiot. But you're not an idiot, you're just twisted. Mm -hmm. So if the poor thing did want you to tickle her tummy, you deserve to get scratched. You see? This, this actually cancels it, it, itself out from here because you're saying, let's, let's look at the structure of it. 
um, P unless Q. Okay, Q is you really thought she was such a perceptive cat that you'd un she'd understand woof woof meant roll over. Okay, um, if if you thought so, if Q, then you're an idiot. If Q then R, um, but not R, and you're just twisted is just a, an insult added on. P unless Q, if Q then R, but not R. Can you see how that all cancels each other out? P unless Q, if Q, then R, but not R. So it all just becomes... But, but again, don't worry about the, figure, the letters I've put in here. Just do it in your, in your own... Try reading it out and see what really counts. OK, let's... So here's the argument with the irrelevancies. Oh, OK, one more thing, the conclusion. I've just taken out the tummy again because we took out the tummy from the first premise, so do it in the conclusion. So here's the argument with the irrelevancies removed, and I hope you agree it starts to look much more simple, much easier to evaluate... Uh, she didn't want you to tickle her, or she didn't realise that's what you were going to do. If she didn't realise, then you went about it in the wrong way. In that case, you deserve to get scratched. So if the poor thing did want you to tickle her, you deserve to get scratched. But let's continue. What's the next step? Sorry, question first. Uh, it could be a conclusion, but don't forget anything could be a conclusion. A conclusion is just the role that something plays in an argument. And in this argument, this is not playing the role of a, a conclusion. It, it is perhaps playing the role of a sub-conclusion, but, but this is the conclusion. Do you see, again, remember that the conclusion is that for which you are arguing. And that's the only thing that makes it a conclusion. But you're absolutely right, that could play the role of, of, the, of a conclusion. OK, what's the next step? Uh, no? Remove inconsistent terms, OK? And cross-references. OK, inconsistent terms. What do we mean by inconsistent terms? Well, if we go back to that argument that we were looking at earlier... Um, OK, this one. Um, do you see how people wanted to have another premise in there? Something about uh, industrial nations need to give emerging nations capital, uh, capital resources or whatever it was. Um, if we look round to this one, if a newly emerging nation is to sustain its growth and it does not have capital resources, it will need help from industrial nations. What does this it need help mean? It will need... What's, what's the help that is implied here? Capital resources. So we're using two different terms for capital resources, aren't we? Here we're using capital resources, and here we're using just help. But actually, they mean the same thing, don't they? So actually, the way this argument, we can reveal the argument much more carefully by saying many newly emerging nations do not have capital resources. Capital resources are necessary for sustained growth. If a newly emerging nation is to sustain its growth and it does not have capital resources, it will need capital resources from industrial nations. Many newly emerging nations will need help, uh, need capital resources from emerging nations. Could you use a pronoun like them? Can you use what, sorry? A pronoun like them instead of, uh, instead of help. Uh, well, you couldn't use them there, will it? Uh, many newly emerging nations will need, oh, them. Um, you mean capital resources. I see, I'm sorry. Uh, no, what... Well, what you're aiming to do is to reveal the structure of the argument, and you do that by getting rid of as many things that, that are distracting you from the structure of the argument as you can. 
And one of the things that's distracting you here is the fact that two different words or phrases are used for the same thing. So what you do is you change them so that they, you're using the same word throughout the arguments. Now, you could just use, many newly emerging nations do not have help. Help is necessary for sustained growth. I mean, this suggests we shouldn't use help, doesn't it? Okay, so let's use capital resources instead. Them is actually a pronoun that, that you, on the whole, you're trying to get rid of rather than put in. So um, I wouldn't use that, but I see why you wanted to. Yeah. Okay, do you see what I mean about removing inconsistent terms then? Have I convinced you? Yes, I think that I was right. Yeah. Uh, you were right about what? So you need to put, so that should be capital resources. Yes, yes, uh, yes, you were right about that. But I hope I was right that that wasn't a suppressed premise. It, it's a matter of an inconsistent term needing to be removed or needing to be made consistent. So let's try it with this, the argument we're looking at now. I've now forgotten which slide we were on. Um, Oh, yeah, uh, now, I was just explaining what inconsistent terms are. OK, that's what an inconsistent term is. What about a cross-reference? If we've got um, Marianne always wears jeans on Friday, she is wearing jeans. Forgot what the argument. Wh what have we got there that we could... I mean, it's like an inconsistent term. The, the, not the jeans, but she... Because she is referring to Marianne. So either make both she, that would be fine, but, but it might fall down elsewhere in the argument, or make both Marianne. So remove the she and, and make it explicit that you mean Marianne. So let's try that in this premise. Now, I'm just going to... A hint here. Um, we're going to leave the she in here because throughout the argument it's she, isn't it? We're never introduced to the cat's name. We, we don't know what her name is. And nor is she referred to as the cat at any point or anything like that. So, in fact, this isn't an inconsistent term. It's consistent throughout, even though it's exactly the sort of thing that you would usually be removing. OK? So she didn't want you to tickle her or she didn't realise that's what you were going to do. Anyone can see anything that wants, you want to... Put, put up your hand if you see something that you'd like to remove. She didn't want you to tickle her, or she didn't realise you were going to tickle her. That was what you were going to do, stands in for you were going to tickle her, doesn't it? We're, we're not changing the meaning by, by making those two terms consistent. We're, we're just making explicit something that in the original premise is left implicit. And here it is. She didn't want you to tickle her, or she didn't realise that you were going to tickle her. I've left the that out, but that doesn't matter. You see? OK, anyone have any problems with that? No? OK, let's move on. What about premise two? If she didn't realise, then you went about it in the wrong way. Very nearly right. The first bit was certainly right. If she didn't realise you were going to tickle her. Do you, do you see you need to add this in? Because otherwise, if you didn't... If she didn't realise, isn't actually a sentence, is it? Until you add, you were going to tickle her. So you complete that sentence by adding that in. What, what about the second half? Anyone have any ideas here? <laughs> then you were going to tickle her in the wrong way. Yes, something like that. Keep it as similar as possible, because all you're doing is trying to get rid of the complications. You're trying to make it as simple as possible, so as to reveal the structure of the argument. And you do that by getting rid of all the things that, that um, are, are just confusing you. So if she didn't realise you were going to tickle her, then you were going to tickle her in the wrong way. Okay, anyone, any questions about that? No? Good. Premise three. Good, well done. Uh, in that case, refers back to the previous premise, doesn't it? And it, it says, if you were going to tickle her in the wrong way, you deserve to get scratched. 
There's two quite separate sentences, aren't there? You were going to tickle her in the wrong way and she didn't realise you were going to tickle her. Now, those are different sentences. You mustn't conflate them because actually they matter to the argument as a, very much so. Um, OK, any other questions about premise three? No, let's move on. Uh, what about the conclusion? It's an easy one, isn't it? OK, if she did want you to tickle her, you deserve to get scratched. Okay, so we take out the poor thing and put in she. Okay. Question? Yeah, sorry. Um, does the conclusion not have to stand as a sentence that makes sense in its own right? This has bothered me from the very beginning. If well, she did want you to tickle her, you deserve to get scratched. It doesn't make any sense. No, it yes, it does. No, it doesn't. What, makes, what is that telling you? She wanted you to tickle her and you deserve... It doesn't make well, sense. If, if the poor cat wanted you to tickle her... Um, oh, I see. You think, OK. Um, if she wanted you to tickle her... You deserve to get scratched. Isn't. 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 OK, I see where you're going. Um, it is a sentence, but you're wanting... OK, shall I tell you what you're doing? And, and I completely sympathise with what you're doing. And what's more, you are not the only person in this room who's doing it. You're probably the only person who's got the courage to <laughs> um, question me on it. What you're doing is you're trying to put the logic in here. OK, you're, you're trying to, to make this... You're trying to make it all follow so that it, it makes sense as an argument. And what you should be doing is just trying to identify what is said here. What you want to put in is this, I think. So if she did want you to tickle her, um, but you went about it in the wrong way or something like that, yeah. then you deserve to get scratched. Is that, is that right? Because the conclusion is then, you know, um, there, there's a missing link to the premises somehow for me in the conclusion. But the, but the conclusion... Uh, yeah, you're wrong. Okay, okay that, <laughs> that's all I'll say right now. You're wrong. And um, what, what you should do is have a look at the argument over the week. And if, if you're still thinking that, if you still don't see what I'm saying, come and see me next week and, and I'll, I'll explain it again. This will convince you. Um, I'm going to reveal the structure of this argument by formalising it. And if that doesn't convince you, nothing will. Okay. We're going to put it into P's and Q's and it'll be a revelation to you how putting it into P's and Q's will make it make much more sense. <laughs> OK, what we've got to do is identify each of the constituent sentences of the argument and assign it a sentence letter. Now, have I gone... No, OK, I haven't done this. OK, um, let's look at premise one. We've got to identify the constituent sentences of that premise and assign it a letter. So just looking at premise one, what are the constituent sentences? What's the first one? She didn't want you to tickle her. OK, and the other one? She didn't realize you were only going to tickle her. OK, well, here are two sentences. Let's provide them with sentence letters. Um, I'd ask you which ones you wanted, but I want you to choose certain ones. So you can choose either P or Q. And I'd rather... <laughs> and I'd P for this one. Good. OK, what, what about the next one? Q, well done. <laughs> Good choices, I have to say. OK, so whenever we use the sentence letter P, that, that means that sentence. It's just standing in for that sentence, OK? And whenever we use the sentence letter Q, that just stands in for that sentence, OK? It's dead simple. There's nothing magical about these things at all. And the reason we use capital letters from this side, this part of the alphabet, that's just conventional. Um, we, if we use capital letters like F, G, etc., we tend to use them for other parts of the language. And if we use lowercase letters like A, B, C, that's for another part of language. So 
the, there is conventions about which part of language you use for which sentence letters. So that's why I want you to use letters from here. OK, so premise one has two constituent sentences. She didn't want you to tickle her, and she didn't realise you were only going to tickle her, and we've labelled them P and Q. OK, premise two, what are the constituent sentences in this letter, this one? What's the first one? She didn't realise you were only going to tickle her. Well, we've got that already, haven't we? So we don't need to put that down. What about the other one? You were going to tickle her in the wrong way, OK? You were going to tickle her in the wrong way. OK, it needs a sentence letter. What should we have? Oh, good. Yes, well done. You've got the idea here. See, you can formalise things dead easily. Uh, OK, um, that's premise two, isn't it? Good. Premise three? OK, you were going to tickle her in the wrong way. That's, that, that's R again. You deserve to get scratched, OK? You deserve to get scratched. What should we call that? S. S. Good. OK, and conclusion. So if she did want you to tickle her... Um, now, that's interesting, because up here we've got she didn't want you to tickle her. Now, do we... Shh, I'm going to put her outside the room. <laughs> no, don't... It is, uh, it's very good that you question things, because that's important. Um, we won't need another sentence letter, because what can we use instead? Not P, can't we? You, don't, you certainly don't need P and not P, because you've got that, just in having P and the, word, and the logical word not. OK, so if she did want you to tickle her, you deserve to get scratched. Do we need anything else? That's S already, exactly. So we, here we've got all the sentences that, are, that make up the argument, haven't we? All the sentences that, that constitute the argument. Now, I need somebody to hold this, please. Somebody come up and hold this for me. OK, there we, there we have an interpretation. That's what that's called, an interpretation. Now, premise one, um, what's the form of that? There's a logical word in that that's holding together two sentences. What are the sentences and what are the logical words? P or Q. P or Q. Good, that's premise one, isn't it? What's premise two? So if, is it Q? She didn't realise. OK, if Q, then not therefore, you're confusing implication and entailment, whoever that was. Um, if Q, then S, was it? R. R, OK. Then the third premise, if you were going to tickle her in the wrong way, you deserve to get scratched. If R, then S. And the conclusion is, uh, if not, uh, she, she didn't want you, if not P, then, no, where's the not, where's the not? No, it's not wrong. <laughs> You'll be outside too in a minute. <laughs> I, there was no not, no, I'm putting the, hang on, I'm putting the not in front of the P because we've got P was she didn't want you to tickle her and the not here is if she did want you to tickle her, okay, but this says you deserve to get scratched, doesn't it? And this says you deserve to get scratched. There's no not snuck in here. Uh, I'm saying not P, but I'm not saying not S, am I? Yeah, you're making, if you make it think something works, you have to put the minus in front of both premises. No, you don't. <laughs> no, because, well, what you put, actually, if you use, um, if you use, no, this says, if not P, then S. Whoops, no, that's. 
Okay, it's only the P that's been negated, not the S. Not the S. Okay. You're getting me confused now. Hold on, we've got four minutes to go. Let, let's finish. Okay, that's fine, because uh, actually, no, we might need that in a minute. Stay there. Okay, so this um, PQRS, um, and here's premise one. Oh, I was going to make you do it like this, but uh, it's all right, you've done it. So... Here, so there's the whole argument, which is exactly what you've had there, what you've got there. Um, oops. I should have put a not there, shouldn't I? And I haven't, but that's my mistake, okay? There's only a not there. She didn't want you to tickle her, or she didn't realise you were going to tickle her. Okay, that's a straightforward either or, isn't it? Either this is the case or that's the case. Then this says, if she didn't realise that you were going to tickle her, then you were going to tickle her in the wrong way. Now, obviously, if you like, something's happened. She's scratched you, hasn't she? And, and somebody said, if she didn't realise you were going to tickle her, then obviously you went about it in the wrong way. Instead of going about it gently, puss, 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 you, you shoved your hand into her tummy and scratched. So if she didn't realise you were going to tickle her, then she... And the implication there is that if she had realised, you wouldn't have got scratched. Is that right? That's the implication there. If she had realised, you wouldn't have got scratched. Okay? she wanted you to? No, no, we're not talking about wanting here at all. You are in the first place. No, no, but the premises are separate. The premises are completely separate. We're looking at the meaning of each one separately. Okay, so this one, the implication is, if she had realised, then, then you wouldn't have got scratched. Um, if you were going to tickle her in the wrong way, you, you deserve to get scratched. Okay, so there's a, a question of dessert coming in here. And so the conclusion is, if she did want you to tickle her, and you went about it in the wrong way, then you deserve to get scratched. So the poor thing was longing for you to tickle her, and um, what she did when you did tickle her was scratch you. Well, why did that happen? Because you went about it in the wrong way. Have, have we got it? Have, has I get that, but I, but I still think the conclusion has to stand in its own right and make sense without the premises. And the premises then... Right, I'm going to shut you up now. <laughs> OK, let's, I, don't, I don't want to leave on a note of confusion. The... The important thing is that what we've done today is we've taken an argument that you looked at, when, and when you looked at it, you went, Ugh, yeah. didn't you? Okay. Well, I said we were going to set it out logic book style. All we're going to do is identify the argument. We're going to analyse the argument, reveal its structure. So what we've done is we've taken the argument, we identified the conclusion of the argument. We all did that fairly easily. We identified each premise. We all did that fairly easily. Yes? Okay. Um, we looked for suppressed premises, but I told you there weren't any, so, so we didn't bother with that one. Then we went through each premise and we removed inconsistent terms, cross-references and irrelevancies and revealed the argument, which might be a very bad argument for all we know, but, but we revealed the argument that was there. What we didn't do is try and impose the argument we would have made because it would have been a better one, um, on the argument that we were trying to analyse. Are you with me? Yes. So all we've done is revealed the arguments here. We've revealed the structure. We've even got it down to P's, Q's, R's and S's. Now, what you should do for, for next week is take one of the arguments that you found this week and try and do that. And an awful lot of that's going to be removing irrelevancies, cross-references and things like that and adding suppressed premises. Um, but it'll give you practice in doing it. And don't forget, this is the important thing. You can apply this methodology either to somebody else's arguments, which is what we've been doing here, and what you will do if you look at arguments from the newspaper, or um, you can apply it to your own arguments. And you think of something for which you often argue, climate change or something like that, or, or I don't know... Um, What's that? that is a very good 
OK, that's a good one. That'll do. Anyway, find something for which you like to argue in the pub. Write down your conclusion and write down your premises and try and make the argument, the argument you actually give so that then when we start evaluating arguments, we can look at it. But you will have identified your own argument and set it out logic book style. Because people often don't do that with their own arguments and therefore don't see that they're missing out a huge premise or that this is happening or that's happening or, or whatever. OK, so if your homework for this week, either take the arguments you found last week and set them out logic book style or choose a claim you'd like to make and see if you can set it out uh, as an argument logic book style. OK? Cool, I'm exhausted. <laughs> <Well done. laughs>